This episode of Full Armor Radio is brought to you by CR101 Radio Network. CR101 Radio Network is a Christian reconstruction internet radio station that hosts and broadcasts lectures, sermons, and podcasts 24-7. We're also brought to you by GCS Apprenticeship Program, which is dedicated to training the next generation of Christian teachers so they can own and operate successful and profitable Christian schools. You can learn more at cr101radio.com and gcsapprenticeship.com. And now to the show. Welcome to another episode of Full Armor Radio. I'm your host, John O'Rourke of Full Armor Ministries, uh, doing evangelism um, in the United States, particularly um, in East Tennessee. And today I wanted to talk about a really important issue, which is the issue of what it means to be born again and how somebody can be born again. Um, this idea sparked from a conversation that I had with a guy um, recently um, and if you if you listen to my programs here, you know that I do Full Armor Radio, which talks about theological issues. And I also post evangelism encounters, which are conversations I have with people out on the street. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to have today. We're going to have a, a mashup of both of those. Because I'm going to talk about this issue of being born again, but I'm also going to play a segment of a, a conversation that I had with a guy. I talked to this guy for close to an hour, about 56, 57 minutes or something like that. Um, and um, he had a lot to say, a lot of interesting concepts that he uh, believes in. But one of the most um, unique um, was his view of how he says he was born again. So this is a guy that... You know, didn't really understand the gospel at all um, when I went to talk to him. Um, somebody who um, really is going through an incredibly difficult time, um, but he but he claims to be a, you know God fearing and a Christian, but yet he doesn't really believe the gospel, and he um, his life does not bear good fruit that would be evidence that he really is born again. So when I asked him. You know what's it mean to be born again? He told me a very interesting story, um, basically about how he went up into a creek and washed away his sins with the water, um, kind of like a self baptism thing. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what he was trying to communicate or not, but it sure sounded like it that that he would go and wash in this creek and that the water would wash away his sins and that he was born again through that experience. Um, so, so there's a couple of issues with that, obviously, and I'll expound upon that uh, after we listen to the clip. Um, but the first issue is, is that you cannot make yourself born again, period. You cannot make yourself born again. And secondly, um, you cannot make yourself born again through baptism or through water or anything like that. Um, in baptism or whatever this was, um, pouring water on yourself or plunging yourself into water is not going to take away your sins. Um, so I want to talk about how somebody is born again and what actually um, cleanses you from your sins. So before I get into that, I want to play this clip. It's a few minutes long. And uh, you get to hear uh, this guy's story, a segment of it at least. All right, one more thing. You ever heard the term being born again? You heard of that before? The bias of using the Bible, Jesus said you must be born again. Do you know what it means to be born again? born again is the Lord to truly come into your heart, take it all away and allow you to have a little bit more peace in your life. I, I feel like I was born again not long ago. I broke on Jack Daniels sitting on the steps of the church that wasn't even mine. Mm-hmm. Don't know how I walked there or how I got back home, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I was that drunk. Mm-hmm. But I, I I don't care to tell you I, I debated suicide. Not, not too far in the past. Yeah, I, I tell you, I done more. I almost, I almost did commit suicide. It, 
it hadn't been my, been for my little brother to open the curtain. Hmm. Shine that light through on my back. I, I don't care to tell you, I had a 20 gauge shotgun pointed right here at the bottom of my chin, and my little brother saved my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not long after that, I found myself on the church. You know what I mean? Yeah. On you know, steps of the church, God's house. Broke, deep down, weak. Like I said, there's, there's nothing but, there was nothing but God carrying me where I went. Yeah. As I tell you, there ain't no street lights on my heart. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, none. And it's a two mile walk to the church. Yeah. How I even got there, I don't. Mm-hmm. Walking down there, walking, walking back, I don't remember. The Lord saved me more than once here in the, your recent past. When my wife ran off and left me for whatever reason, I stopped right there in Rome Mountain at the creek. For, I had I had a hymn playing in my song, playing in my head over and over and over. I was doing like 20 miles an hour from here off from Elizabeth and all the way to Rome Mountain. Mm-hmm. And I pulled in and the good Lord told me to told me to take some of the water out of that river he blessed me with fed my children I, I fed my kids and my wife and kids before they spoke the Lord out of this river and that if that don't tell you what kind of God God fearing person God loving person I am God blessing me every day you know what I mean because I know for a fact if I ain't got a dime a dollar a friend a ride I come right down here to the river I can step up here in the woods and God will provide for me and my family and he always has. But the good Lord told me to take the water out of that river he's blessed me with so many times and wash my sins away with it. Pick up a stone and carry that stone. And all my sins be forgiven. I be taken care of. And I'll tell you, brother, since that day, I ain't had no word. I, I haven't thought one day, another day about suicide. I never had an uncontrollable urge to drink. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I haven't sat down and pulled a three-day bender. You know what I mean? I can, I can drink. Not that I'm proud of it, but I, a month ago, I was sitting down with three-fifths of liquor of a night, and I was awake, ready to go to work at 7 a.m. You know what I mean? Didn't even get drunk. Didn't even pass out from Three-fifths of liquor, but I don't weigh 130 pounds. Right, you know what yeah, mean? yeah. And, you know what I mean? Right. The Lord's let me have a good time with me. Have a good peace on, peace on earth since... Since that day, I, I washed my sins away with the, with the river he provided me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then, then I was born again. And this is this is how Jesus talked about being born again. He said, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? He won't, he won't go to heaven. And what it means to be born again, he, he gave this analogy. He said, you'll know a person by their fruit like you know a tree by its fruit. So if we walked around and we found a tree and it had apples growing on it, that would indicate what kind of tree it is, right? It's an apple tree. Right. So the analogy is, same with, same with a, a person's life, is that if somebody's born again, they're going to bear certain kinds of fruit in their life. Their life's going to look different. And these are the three main things that, that are fruits of being born again, that are results of being born again. One is that you're repentant of your sins. We already talked about that. That means you hate your sins, you turn away from them. You're no longer, um, you no longer have peace with your sins. You're now you're fighting against them. Secondly, it's trusting in Christ alone, Jesus alone for your salvation. Not at all trusting in your own so-called good works, or trusting in yourself, you trust in Christ alone. And thirdly, that desire for obedience, your life is going to look different in that you're going to try to obey God, not to try to earn salvation, remember, because that wouldn't be trusting in Christ alone, but you obey God out of thankfulness to Him for giving salvation as a free gift. That's the big difference. I don't try to obey God as a Christian, try to earn points for heaven, because that would be a denial of what Jesus has done. That's what a lot of people in this Bible do. That's right. You're right, man. A whole lot of them. That's the whole reason I don't go to church. But the true gospel that, that Jesus taught and that his people taught is that salvation is a free gift, but when you're saved, God will give you a new heart. That's what it means to be born again, a new heart with new desires so that you will follow after God, obey him out of thankfulness, not to try to earn heaven by it. It says this um, in the Old Testament. It says, God says, I'll take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my commandments. 
right? He's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a new person. Think about the imagery of being born again. Think about it. You're a new person, right? So that's the whole point. So what it means to be born again is something that God does to a rebellious sinner. He gives them a new heart so that they repent of their sins, trust in Christ alone, and desire to obey God out of, a, out of a thankfulness. Um, and the only thing that can really truly wash away your sins is what Jesus has done, his, his blood, his, his death. Because that God will, will count you righteous and innocent because of what Jesus has done if you trust in him alone and repent of your sins. Right. Okay, so that's the segment of me uh, talking to that guy. Um, a couple, a couple of points um, here is that number one, nobody can make themselves be born again, right? By any means whatsoever, because you'll notice when the Bible speaks of being born again, it's something that God does. Now. The, the one of the primary texts on regeneration or being born again is from John chapter 3. And this is where Jesus um, has his interaction with Nicodemus and has this discussion about being born again. I actually quoted this um, in that segment um, of me talking to that guy just a minute ago. So here's uh, what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? So, the point there is that one must be born again in order to see. Okay? In order to see spiritually, to see the kingdom of God. One must be born again. Otherwise, you're blind. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? So just like many others, especially in the Gospel of John, um, when Jesus is speaking of spiritual things, people take him literally. Um, for example, um, in the next chapter in John chapter 4, Jesus speaks to the woman at the well and offers, offers her living water. Now she thinks that he is talking about H2O, but he's not, right? He's talking about spiritual things. And this, this sort of thing continues on. Um, throughout the Gospel of John. So Nic Nicodemus thinks that Jesus is speaking literally of entering your mother's womb and being born when he talks about being born again. So Jesus um, expounds upon it. He says, uh, verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Listen to this part. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay? So, just like the wind blows where it wishes, so does the Spirit move how he wishes. And then Nicodemus' response, verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? See, being born again is something that's basic. Uh, it's something that is should be considered a basic doctrine of Christianity um, because it's so essential. I mean, listen to what Jesus says. If you don't, if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And he says later on, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? So, he says, you must be born again. So, what does that mean? So, when he says this phrase, uh, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Some people misuse that. And they say, well, that means you have to be baptized. Being born of the water means you have to be water baptized. So, this guy um, that I was talking to there, we went and washed himself in the river. Um, some people may say, yes, you have to go wash in the water in order to actually be, be born again and be, be cleansed of your sins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that's not the case. Um, this verse is actually hearkening back to um, something in the Old Testament. Now, you'll notice what Jesus said in Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things about being born again? What does that tell us? That Nicodemus should have known. He should have understood what it means to be born again. And he should have known that from the scriptures, right? 
Nicodemus was a Pharisee. They studied the scriptures. He ought to have known this basic and crucial doctrine. Well, here's the verse that, that Jesus is referring back to when he talks about being born of the water and the spirit. It's from Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. This is what it says. This is God speaking. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Now, is that literally talking about H2O? No, no. He's talking about cleansing them spiritually, cleansing them from their sins. It says verse 26, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Okay, you see that? See the water and the spirit? He's saying, I'm going to cleanse you of all your, all your idolatry, all your filth, all your sin. And I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my commandments. That's what being born again means is that you're, he takes out that heart of stone, gives you a new heart, puts his Holy Spirit within you so that you walk after God. So that, as I said to him, so that you trust in the Lord. And then particularly you trust in Jesus Christ alone so that you're repentant of your sins, so that you strive for obedience to God out of gratitude to him. Not because you think you can earn salvation by trying to be a good person, but out of gratitude and love for God because of who he is and what he's done for you. So when we talk about being born again, you'll notice, what, it, what does it say here in Ezekiel? God says he'll do these things. Can you take out your, your own heart of stone and put a new heart in there? And can you bring the Holy Spirit into, into you? No, it's all completely done by God. Um, being born again is something that God does. It's described in Romans chapter 6 as being resurrected, spiritually speaking. It's described as being raised to newness of life. He says that we have died with Christ, and, and moreover, we are raised with him into newness of life. Let me read the, uh, the text here. This is from Romans chapter 6. He says um, in verse uh, 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, that's Jesus, Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died once he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Right? So, our old self had been crucified with Christ, and we are raised again, resurrected um, to newness of life, spiritually speaking. And again, that was that indicate it's something that's done by the power of God. You cannot resurrect yourself, right? You cannot take out your heart of stone and give yourself a spiritual heart transplant. You cannot bring the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit blows like the wind wherever he wishes, right? He goes wherever he wishes. So, what does that mean? That, that you can, you, that means that you cannot do anything. That does, that means that you cannot go into the river and wash away your sins and make yourself born again. Now that raises the, another issue I wanted to talk about is that can water or baptism actually wash away your sins? Um, and the answer of course is, is no. There's a couple of texts um, that I'm going to look at. Let's look at Revelation um, chapter seven, verse 14. Um, but we'll, we'll read some of the context. Great, great, uh, great text here. Um, from Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. Okay. So these people are standing before the lamb. That's Jesus Christ. These are all of his elect people from every tribe, uh, peopled and tongue. And they're standing before uh, the Lamb, and they're clothed in white robes, right? And it says in verse 10, And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, and who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. 
right? So salvation belongs to, to God and to the Lamb, to Jesus Christ. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where have they come from? What a great question. For, we, we, don't we want to know who are these people? Verse 14, I said to him, my Lord, you know, right? That's a, a humble way of saying, I want to hear from your lips who these are, because so, I don't necessarily know. So John says, I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, listen, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. You hear that? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, as the hymn goes. And that's right. We, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's almost a little bit counterintuitive that, that their robes are made white by the blood of Jesus, you know, and obviously blood doesn't make things white um, in, a, in, a, in a physical sense. But what's being said here is that they are, they are completely clean in the sight of God in perfect, pristine white robes because Jesus has died for them because he has taken the penalty in their place, that all of their guilt, all of their filthiness, all of their guilty stains are, were transferred to Christ, put on him, and God the Father crushed him in their place. Right? He, punished them in, in, he punished him in their place. And therefore, they are white, clean in the sight of God. We're also told something similar in, in 1 John, um, authored by the same apostle John, he says this in 1 John 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, that's an important verse regarding being born again. If we say that we're Christians, but yet walk in darkness, we lie. We do not practice the truth. Being born again is going to bear good fruits. It's a fact. If you're born again, you have died to sin, you have crucified the flesh and are walking by the spirit now. But then verse seven, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, listen to this part. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. So he's saying, if you really are a born, really a Christian, a born again, true Christian, then all of your sins um, are, are cleansed and washed away by the blood of Jesus, by the death of Jesus. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So that would indicate that you're not a Christian either if you say you're not a sinner. That's a prerequisite to becoming a Christian is to confess your sins. But he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And he says in the chapter 2, verse 1, the very next verse, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Right? So, we have this thing is that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. When we sin, we have an advocate. That's Jesus Christ who has paid the penalty for our sins. It says he is a propitiation. That means the wrath that was going towards us has been turned away and put on Jesus instead. Propitiation means a turning away of wrath uh, by, sacri by a sacrifice. And Jesus is the sacrifice that turns away the wrath onto himself instead of it coming on us, what we deserve. He's a propitiation for us and for people all over the world from people from every tribe and tongue, people group, just like Revelation 7 said, just like Revelation 7 said, so does First John mean when he says he's died for those of the whole world, um, for people from, from all over the world, um, that he has died for people from every tribe, language, nation, people group, etc. Um, so anyway, so this, so back to this guy that I was talking to, Obviously, what we have, what we had there, is he said that he could wash away his sins in the water of the river, but that's not true. Um, we only can be washed; our, our sins can be cleansed from us and washed and washed away from us only because of what Jesus has done by dying on the cross. So, 
with that in mind, I just want to talk about one more thing, and that is, um, what is, just briefly, what's the relationship between the sacrament of baptism, water baptism, and salvation? Well, sacraments are signs and seals of, of spiritual promises, and um, if I jump back into Romans chapter 6, I didn't read this part earlier, but I'll read it now. You can see what baptism is signifying uh, here in this in this chapter. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Okay. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life, right? So, what we have here is this um, um, relationship between the sign, which is water baptism, and what it signifies, which in this case is regeneration, um, dying to sin and being raised to newness of life, spiritual resurrection, spiritual new life, being born again. So, baptism signifies that very plainly here, um, baptized into Christ, and baptized into his death, and also being raised with him, we are united with Christ. See, so we're baptized into him. And um, so, that's, that's really important. So, we understand that baptism signifies being born again. But that raises the question, does baptism make you born again? And the answer is no. It's simply a sign. It's simply a sign that points to being born again. But somebody could be water baptized and not be born again. And on the inverse, somebody could be born again and not be water baptized. Um, for example, if they don't have um, opportunity to be water baptized, say somebody is saved um, out on the battlefield or something, and uh, then they get killed. Um, they go to heaven because water baptism is not so necessary to being saved that you must be water baptized in order to go to heaven. Although it's something that Christians uh, will do um, at a, because... God says so, um, and we want to do what's pleasing to God. But baptism is not so linked to being born again that you can't be born again apart from it, or that you could receive water baptism and you could still not be born again. In fact, that happens very often, especially here in the Bible Belt, where people are baptized two, three, four times and are still not born again. Um, Baptism does not save you. Um, It is a sign of regeneration, a signifier, a pointer to it, but it does not save you. Just as in the Old Testament, circumcision was a sign of of being born again, Um, but nevertheless, you could be circumcised and not be born again. Um, For example, Ishmael, Abraham's son Ishmael, was not born again, yet he was circumcised, and Abraham's grandson Esau was also circumcised, but again, was not born again. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, this is where we have um, a thing about circumcision. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your hearts and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. Right? So, that's the same thing as being born again, circumcision of the heart. But see, physical circumcision did not make your heart circumcised. It was a sign of it, but it did not make it happen because what makes somebody born again is God's sovereign act of giving them new life, taking out their heart of stone, and giving them a new heart of of flesh. So, baptism doesn't save you. But what we have um, in the Bible is what we call um, sacramental union language or... um, Basically, what that means is that sometimes the Bible will talk about the sacrament as if it is the thing it signifies. It'll talk about the sign as if it is the thing that it signifies. So, in this case, it'll talk about baptism as if it is the thing it signifies, which is regeneration. And that's true of of the Lord's Supper as well. Remember, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, he holds up a piece of bread and says, this is my body given for you. Now, was that piece of bread his body? No, no, it wasn't his body, obviously. His body was right there in front of them um, when his body was holding up that piece of bread, right? Um, But he says, this is my body. Why? Because the bread signifies his body. Then he holds up the cup of wine and says, this is my blood. Well, 
it's not literally his blood because his blood was coursing through his veins at that point. But he's talking about um, the wine being a sign of his blood. So he's saying, this is my body, this is my blood. They are signs of um, Jesus's body and blood um, being sacrificed for his people. So it's very important. Same thing with baptism. Um, the water itself does not save you, um, but it does signify salvation. Um, and that's very important for us to understand. So you'll see a, a couple places uh, some in the Bible where, where it'll speak of the sign, baptism, as if it is the thing that it signifies. So I'll just read one example before I close this program from um, 1 Peter. Uh, Peter, Peter says this, and I think it's a great example because he um, clarifies what he means in the text so that we're not confused. So, 1 Peter um, chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ, who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subject, subjected to him. Let's break that down. So he gives, Peter gives this example of, of uh, Noah and the ark, and he and his family passed through the water and were saved by passing through the water and the ark, right? So he's saying baptism corresponds to that. That image um, corresponds to baptism of, of Noah passing through the water and, and was saved. So it is with us, not that water itself or passing through the water um, saves you, but that what it signifies saves you. So when he says baptism now saves you, he's talking about what it signifies, which is particularly an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Which harkens back to what we looked at in Romans 6, where we died to sin and are resurrected with him spiritually. But Peter particularly says, baptism now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the flesh. He's saying not, not the physical water, washing with water, not that, but what it signifies, right? What baptism signifies is what I'm talking about, which is union with Christ, being um, resurrected with him into newness of life. Um, that's what's being talked about here. So he's saying, but he, but he uses the phrase, baptism saves you. And that, that's why people say, well, look, therefore, you know, you have to be saved, uh, or you have to get baptized to be saved. And no, the whole Bible, the whole Bible uses the sacramental union language where the sign is spoken of as if it is the thing it signifies, right? So just like with the Lord's Supper, this is my body, this is my blood. Well, so it is with baptism. Baptism, water baptism doesn't actually make you born again, but it's a sign of it. It signifies it. And that's something that we really need to understand And because there are many, many people out there who think that you have to be uh, water baptized in order to be saved, or they think that water baptism regenerates you or makes you born again. It's called baptismal regeneration. Um, and we need to dispel these, these heretical uh, errors um, from from being taught in the churches. Um, these things are very, very damaging. And sadly, I do come across these ideas somewhat frequently out on the streets. So with that, to kind of review, um, you cannot make yourself born again. That's a work of God. Water will not cleanse away your sins. Uh, only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. Um, what he has done, his sacrifice, his death. And um, the Bible sometimes uses sacramental union language, that is, language where the, where the sacrament, the sign, is spoken of as if it is the thing that it signifies, because there's such a union between the sign and what it signifies that the Bible will speak of it in such a way as if they are one and the same. But of course, we know that they are not. The, the uh, bread in the Lord's Supper is not literally the body of Christ, neither is the wine literally the blood, but they are signs of his body and blood. And the same with baptism, water, the water doesn't actually cleanse you from your sins or make you born again, but it does signify that's a sign of it. Um, like Peter said, it's not a removal of dirt from the body or from the flesh. It's not, it's not the, uh, the cleansing with the water that does anything. 
So I hope that was helpful to you. I hope that helps clarify some things and uh, maybe will help you answer some questions that people may have about being born again and how baptism may relate to that. And um, if you're not already, um, you can subscribe to Full Armor Radio on all of your favorite, any of your favorite podcast catchers. Um, Also, there's a post many things on the YouTube channel, Full Armor Ministries on YouTube. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Just check it out. Um, You can check out the website, fullarmorministries.org, and get some more information there about uh, what we're doing over here. And uh, with that, I'm going to sign off here. Um, Hope you have a good day, and God bless you.